We're not just selling CPUs and GPUs into Hollywood. We're figuring out with the studios what works, what doesn't work, because without technology, films are just plays, right? That's James Knight, Global Director of Media and Entertainment at AMD. James has a long history of working at the cutting edge of filmmaking, going all the way back to the first Avatar. That was a light bulb moment for me. It was a perfect marriage of technology and art and storytelling coming together. In this episode of VP Land, we talk about how James and AMD worked with Gareth Edwards on The Creator. He came to AMD to get his AI education, so to speak. How workflows have been changing and speeding up production. And I remember him saying that he was able to do more setups than he's ever done in that short amount of time. Why running volumes for virtual production is not just about GPUs. The importance of compute has never been as important as it is now. If you don't have a particular CPU, then it's going to be a lot slower, and that's time and money. And a whole bunch more. That's a good question. I've not really been asked it before, but, but should have been. Links for everything we talk about are available in the description. And for more content like this, be sure to subscribe to the VP Land newsletter at vp-land.com. And now, enjoy my conversation with AMD. AMD's James Knight. Well, James, nice to meet you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you joining. Why don't we just uh, start off a Thanks, bit? Man. Just tell me a bit about your background and how uh, you ended up at your current role and what you're doing at AMD. A bit about my background. I started out in visual effects. I've been in uh, film, post-production and visual effects about 24 years now that it's 2024. Um, and then I moved to Los Angeles in 2006, to late 2006, to be the, I was the motion capture, performance capture project manager on Avatar. I have two words for that, and education, <laughs> right? So, so that was that was great to talk about. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, and then a lot was le- a lot was learned then, a lot of connections made, a lot of friendships made, um, and I think that uh, I ended up having some great relationships with people in Los Angeles and I decided to stay. I was going to leave after Avatar, but I I stuck around. Uh, My family's based here now and I've been here ever since. So that's now, that's now 18 years and I've shifting slightly from visual effects production to the technology side of visual effects because without CPUs and GPUs, there is no, uh, you know, without technology, films are just plays, right? Uh, so, so that's what I'm doing is I, I work with the studios and, uh, and, I, and I work with creatives. I work directly with the uh, directors. Um, it's kind of a really fun, nuanced role. But I got in it because I was – the area of visual effects that I was working in that I moved to Los Angeles for was pretty technical, um, and then um, I got approached by, by AMD in 2015, uh, 2016, to, to start working with them. And, and, uh, and so that's how I've gotten even more ingrained in the, in the uh, visual effects pipelines. So that's, that's anything that's, uh, that's, that's created and that, that is fake, essentially, in the screen, right? Set extension, CG characters, rendering. Uh, packaging content, delivering it, everything. So uh, it's it's been a wild ride. Um, but that's in a nutshell. That's kind of like my journey and 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 how I got to where I'm going. Nice. And actually, I did want to ask you about Avatar because I saw there was uh, somebody you mentioned in another interview uh, where you said that Avatar, looking back, kind of felt like one of the first time instances of some form of virtual production. Uh, so can you talk a bit more about th- how your impressions of that, uh, like why you say that? Well, before the, the software that we, that was used on that film was, was created by a company called giant studios, which, which is no longer, but those brilliant guys were out of Atlanta, Georgia, and it was used on Lord of the Rings and a few other video games before avatar Avatar was when everything was brought together. It was almost like at the time I would describe it to my parents as it's imagine being able to look. Uh, I, I use my parents as an example because it's essentially they're neophytes and they wouldn't understand what I was doing, right? <laughs> so I'd try and tell them what I was doing. Imagine if you could see a PlayStation 2 game in real time and that you were filming that and then it was going to later be rendered to photographically real. 
it was very much uh, John Landau, the producer, would have multiple people come by and visit the set, and so would so would Jim. And it was really um, interesting and bizarre to see people's reaction. They couldn't quite get it initially. That 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 area in the brain, a road hadn't been forged to it for these people. So they would look through the virtual camera and they would say, "I don't." I don't understand. These people are standing right here, but in in the virtual camera, I'm looking and he's he's in Pandora and there's a river running and I don't quite get. So we had to kind of dissect it a little bit and show them. Um, and we and we really thought that if we brought a lot of people by, it was John's thoughts actually, but but you know we were on board John Lando. We really thought that if if we showed enough people that virtual production, those two words together, virtual and production would become more of a mainstay in production. And we really thought everybody would would, would be doing this a lot sooner than, than they have. Of course, it didn't happen as quite as quickly because I think people think virtual production is only for James Cameron. Well, now we know it isn't, right? You don't have to have James Cameron budget to do it. But it was a great way to, to, to make a film. Um, and I remember the last day that Jim did a, he, he was called Jim, uh, the last day that um, Jim shot something with a virtual camera, we all stood around and, and spoke about the experience of it. Um, and I remember somebody said, I don't think audiences are going to quite know what they are watching and hopefully they have an emotional connection to it because of the camera movements going through a jungle. You can't have a dolly in a jungle Right and the, and the movements of of, of, sh- of following around CG characters as if they really existed, um, those organic film movements I I believe are what drew people in. So I think it was a perfect marriage of technology and art and storytelling coming together, and, and he and he was the best director to do that. And so that was a light bulb moment for me. And I think that's kind of what I referred to pre- in previous interviews is is Art and technology are overtly related. They're like paternal twins, you know, in, in that they're not identical, but they were born at the same time. Because without without uh, technology, there is no art. And I and I really thought that that Avatar really showed that in, in an amazing way. Yeah, it was definitely definitely groundbreaking. Um, when uh, so when you say you thought that it would catch on uh, sooner. Uh, but it didn't. Was it just a matter of like the technology uh, becoming more affordable or becoming more like what 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 were led to be the next steps where this did uh, eventually? And I guess what we're talking about here is more. I mean, I mean, his type of this that the Avatar virtual production was a very specific type of production. But I guess what would we classify as now? Maybe like a previs in some aspects, or a uh, like shooting with a virtual camera. Uh, in a virtual set with like motion tracking actors, I'm trying to think. Well, how would we best categorize this now, and how did the, how has this technology sort of been adapted today virtual in more production of an everyday has, production? Yeah, a virtual production still is a kind of a, a, a big umbrella. There are subsets underneath it, right? So, previs is considered virtual production because you're you know it's it's all CG. And it, and, it, and it is part of pre-production, but it also can be part of production. So if you've got a busy street corner, you could have somebody either create that street corner or you could go and LiDAR scan it in and then you can figure out where you want to point your camera and when you want to point your camera when you've paid to have that street corner shut down so you're not discovering on the day because that's that's going to burn through cash. You can also figure out which what lenses you want. And so for planning purposes, I, I think that probably... It was the perce- the wrongly perceived cost. This is amazing, but this is Jim Cameron, so it's gonna. Yeah. I don't have that kind of money, right? I think that was the first issue, and I think, I, I think secondly too, there was a, the, uh, there wasn't. It, it just took a. Sometimes, ironically, Hollywood can be slow to adopt really new, helpful technology, and and there were there's a couple of great societies formed out of uh, the guys at Weta and, and, and ILM and um, 
Autodesk, the 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 uh, the company that makes the application Motion Builder, which was the backbone of 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 Avatar. It was what we streamed the data in, and then we would deliver the files in this. Um, I think that uh, David Moren, who was a kind of a galvanizing person, he created the Virtual Production Society, and we would meet about maybe six times a year and try and educate Hollywood. And so, and we would have events and show people virtual cameras, but it, but it really is uh, tough to, to push that forward and to, and to uh, have more productions use a method because pr- virtual production is a methodology. It's not just one thing. There are, there are many ways to do it. Um, I think, if I had a time machine, if I wanted it to happen quicker, I think what we could have done is educate not just the production people, but also the people in accounting, the people in um, uh, the people in procurement. And I think that those guys would have gone, ah, oh, wait a minute. So you could save us more money on discovering uh, where we should point the camera. Um, we could actually figure out what story beats work and what story beats don't. And there are a few companies that were trying to figure this out, like third floor previs. Um, Glenn Derry started uh, Fox Vis- uh, started Video Hawks and Technoprops, uh, which uh, Technoprops ended up becoming Fox Visual Effects Labs, and those guys were virtually ra- rota- uh, r- rapidly prototyping films. So you know, I, I think it's just um, when you have something new and you're a disruptive entity, the virtual production arm of Hollywood, it, it, it takes a minute. You know, it, it takes a minute. That, that's kind of why it begins to describe. I don't think I'm de- able to describe everything, um, mm-hmm. but, but that kind of gives you a hint as to why it was a bit difficult to, to bring this new way of making um, either pieces of film or a whole film uh, uh, to get uh, to, to Hollywood. Also, one I will say one thing else uh, on this subject. Virtual production is not just for a CG film. It, you mentioned previs. Previs under the umbrella of virtual production can be used, and is used now, on most Hollywood films to to figure out what goes where and 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 what order I should shoot things in and where I should be pointing the camera and the sun's going to be here, that kind of thing. So it is used more and more. It just took a minute. Yeah, and I feel like there's um, this perception as well, like this be- virtual production, like requires. I mean, it does require a lot more. Like you're flipping the, uh, you're flipping the the VFX from post to like pre and building out your your virtual sets beforehand, and that you might be more locked into specific shots. But you said like, oh, it actually unlocks some more creativity, or like, how, can you expand on that? Of like how it opens up ideas or opens up. The flexibility to 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 discover yeah, more it, it does. shots or new shots it opens up um actually it, yeah it, it opens up more it, it actually allows for it allows you more time because it, it's a lot less expensive to have a guy in a volume in a motion capture volume that's what we call when when you're in a in a in a motion track in a motion capture area that's a, a volume if we had a couple of guys in suits in a CG environment and a virtual camera, you can make some mistakes. And I, I saw them being mistake made on, on Avatar. Out of mistakes, you can have brilliant pieces of art. You, I remember on, on Avatar, somebody screwed up and, and had the, um, the virtual camera, they hit the joystick, and all of a sudden, uh, Jake and the Teary were followed up the the tree um from above and 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 uh obviously uh it was deemed acceptable because that shot is in the film but i don't think that would have happened if we were shooting it practically uh i don't think the time would have been um allowed to to kind of allow those um mistakes also it is virtual production does allow um for better art for better storytelling because you're eliminating guesswork. Um, and so you're getting in the frame, uh, ordinarily without it, if you're shooting a CG film, you, you, you're not using real time animation. You're kind of like you're sh- either shooting a film plate. 
So think, think Jurassic Park. I use this in, in, in other talks and when I do presentations on virtual production. If you, if you go back and look at Jurassic Park that was released in the 90s, there's one lock off shot about two thirds of the way the film, through the film where the T-Rex comes through, um, and they're hiding behind a big log and he, and he, and he eats a few velociraptors. It, the camera really doesn't move. If you had virtual production back then, you'd be able to follow the T-Rex around if, as if it really existed. But it was much safer back there to just animate to that film plate for, for the animation people. The thing about virtual production too, it's not just better for streamlining and for story beats and for the actors too because they kind of know it's not just a tennis ball they're acting to. They can see offset that are reacting to this dinosaur or this alien or this building or there's this set extension, mm-hmm. even in Boardwalk Empire. HBO used virtual production for set extensions way back then, so then you had a frame. It's also better for the audience because it's more it's more organic and you have those uh, organically driven character uh, film plates. So I'm, I'm doing that because that's, that's, that's <laughs> how you hold, I, I guess, a virtual Moving camera. Moving your camera, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I didn't work on Tintin, uh, which was a fully virtual production film directed by Spielberg, but I did eat the food on it. Um, I, it, was, it was shot in the building where we were finishing Avatar, and so we got to eat uh, catering, right? And mm. I, I watched Stephen do it during breaks, and I remember him saying um, when the film wrapped that he was able to do more setups than he's ever done in his in his career in that short amount of time. So he c- he can do multiple different scenes um, and and walk things through. And so it really was not only a cost savings to him, but a time savings equal better story, equal better performance, that that kind of thing. So I, I think. You know, in life, not just in Hollywood, we're always looking for better, faster, cheaper. And I think that uh, I'm not, I don't like the word cheap, but better, faster, less expensive. Less it, expensive is, yeah. is essentially, <laughs> yeah, is essentially because cheap's pejorative. Less expensive is uh, th- those three things together are, are really what I think from the bird's eye view, virtual production brings to uh, filmmaking and, and, and television as well. So how did we go from uh, avatar and virtual cameras uh, to stagecraft uh, virtual production on an LED volume uh, like we've sort of traditionally been associating with, or not traditionally, but now we've more come to be associating with virtual production today? So I think, yeah, the LED, it's almost like, it's almost a bit, it's almost like the in the reverse, right? So virtual production and, and performance capture. So let's take performance capture You've got uh, Sam Worthington in a in a suit playing Jake Sully. He's in a spandex suit with markers on him, and he's not standing in front of an LED screen. He's on a grey stage, and 100% of everything filmed with video cameras on that is just for reference for the artist to to do the motion edit. And and Sam's his face is never going to be seen by the by the final what the audience sees. That's all CG. The, the and this is why I'm saying the the umbrella of virtual production is a bit wider now because of um, the way it's perceived now and the, or the, the I should say the 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 most famous part of virtual production now is is what was really uh, promoted cleverly and 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 rightly so by the production team stagecraft on mandalorian right it's the reverse because now you're taking live action actors very well very well costume designed um fantastic props in the foreground and the and the background is you know uh in some cases unreal engine uh on on um, micro leds or it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, ILM's proprietary real-time renderer, but I think that uh, that that Mandalorian came out right during the pandemic, right? And so it was almost like the perfect storm that that needed to fan the flames of, of virtual production. So I feel like virtual production really became a little bit of a celebrity because of the pandemic. So we we could actually have smaller crews. And we can shoot 
things that look like they're in all these different locations, but they're really on a soundstage. And I think that um, it was a it was a great handoff, so to speak, in that um, in that that was the, the the next chapter in virtual production. And that's not to say because it, it it isn't to say the that the way Avatar was done is still being used. There aren't. It's not like uh, those scenes in the jungle or, or underwater or in, in, in the way of water. Those are all done CG as well. Um, and, and, and the premise of how the first one was done was, was used in the, se- in the second Avatar. Um, but it's taking what, we, what, what the community pioneered in virtual production 1.0, if you will, um, and now I, th- I feel like Stagecraft and those guys and Pixamondo, Sony are doing stuff. All different studios are experimenting with their different version of, of what, what was shown worldwide on, on Mandalorian. I mean, it, it looked fantastic when I told mm. – because family members are a great way – because I work in film and TV, right? So family members are a great way to have those, uh, those layman conversations of like – so what did you think of the backgrounds there? Like, you know, wh- where do you think that was shot? And uh, one person might say, oh, it looked like it was done in Jordan or, or Indonesia mm. or, or it was shot. I'm like, no, that was shot on a soundstage. Everything in the background was, was CG, and they thought that was, that was fantastic. But I think, I think, look, there weren't a lot of great things that happened out of the pandemic. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. billionaires getting richer, great for them. Uh, but one of the great things that happened to us – was that it it fanned the fames of virtual production. I feel like the pandemic really ironically helped um, virtual production uh, uh, become more of a celebrity, and and now I believe it's more widely used. And those two words together aren't something to where people go, I'm embarrassed to say I don't really know what that means. You know, (laughs) I think, think, you know. Was there also a tipping point just in the technology and the processing getting fast enough to run this in real time? Like, would this have been possible five years prior to uh, Mandalorian? It was possible, but it was the it was the the fidelity was what wasn't nearly as good as what it was as what it is now. So back in Avatar, well, we did we didn't have there was real time facial. We had it, but it wasn't amazing back then. I mean, that was. I mean, that was a long time ago. It was, you know, four, what is that? Eighteen years ago or so when we first started. Um, now there's a bunch of those companies like Faceware and multiple others that can do real time facial, and you can do real time body and facial in tandem at, at the same time. But yeah, five years ago it it wasn't where it was. Now it, it keeps getting better. I mean, it's it's the backgrounds and some of the characters, if you have hard services, like as long as you don't have necessarily like, um, uh, like biological faces in real time, that's, that's harder to do, but we are getting closer and closer to coming over the, the uncanny Valley. Um, uh, which is, I shouldn't have even said that. That's something else to talk about. But, but if you're doing a CG robot with a hard helmet, let's imagine a, a stormtrooper. Or pick another. Everybody always goes for a Star Wars reference, but but some kind of something from Battlestar Galactica, or you know, <laughs> or fighter you know, helmet, or something. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that that is easier to do in in real time. Um, you still wouldn't have final right right there and then on the stage, but we are getting dangerously closer and closer to the final fidelity that you would see on stage that the audience would see when they pe- when they go to the cinema or, or, or when they watch it on TV at home. Yeah, it, it, it is getting better. And the compute, the, the importance of compute has, has never been as important as it is now. So for, for like, if you open up a, a session in, in Unreal Engine or you, you open up a particular steam that you want to shoot on on a virtual stage with those micro led screens it matters what kind of cp what cpu you have in there right it's got to be high core count and and uh fairly high frequency um so it can you it can render out the scene quickly so then you can shoot on it if you don't have a particular cpu 
um, in the system or you have somebody building systems that they don't really know what they're doing, um, then it's going to be a lot slower and that's time and money because you're going to have a crew, you know, not a big crew, but you're going to have a, a, a crew standing around waiting for, for setups and, and the time between setups is, is what costs uh, the most money because that's, that's waiting time. But yeah, the, hmm. the technology is, is getting better and better. It's a, it's, it's a CPU and I don't know how technical your audience is. Feel free to explain because I'm also just very curious. As about, well. So like, feel okay, free to how about this? It. How about this? If you think of a computer, I was about to hold one up, but they're all plugged in. Um, it's like <laughs> the back cave in here. I've got like five screens. Um, if you think of a computer, liken a computer to a human head, right? The, bre- the brain will be the CPU, the central processing unit, and the, your eyes would be the GPU, which is the graphics processing unit. And so uh, the real-time process is, is mostly a GPU, mostly the eyes, because you need to be able to see that on, this, uh, uh, on the set. Um, during setups and when you're building up a scene or you want to open up another project to shoot this part of the movie now it has to render those out and that's why it matters what kind of cpu you have because you can't have just the one on your grandmother's laptop because that's not gonna that's not gonna work even though your grandmother's laptop might have the most high powered highest powered gpu graphics processing unit um it's Mm. not gonna matter you need the two in tandem um and so it's 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 not um it's not it's not that complicated, but it's not just as straightforward as going to Best Buy and, and picking up a, a you know a workstation. You've got to have it properly configured. So technology does enter into it to, to sort of answer your question. Uh, technology does sometimes it, it is an inhibitor to, to certain things, but it's less and less so as time goes by. Of virtual production. I mean, it's 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 constantly getting um, better and better. But it's it's at a point now where. Anybody who's not seen a virtual production set before, if they show up on a on a virtual production set, they're going to be awfully impressed about what what's capable presently in twenty twenty four. All right, real quick, if you're enjoying this conversation with James Knight about GPUs, CPUs, AI processors, all that stuff, then you will like the VP Land newsletter, where twice a week we send a bunch of links and articles and resources about all of this type of stuff. So you can subscribe to that newsletter over at vp-land.com. It is 100% free. Just pop your email in. You get the newsletter twice a week. Stay updated on the latest trends in tech, in virtual production, AI, and filmmaking, and everything that's changing the way we are making movies. All right, now back to the interview. Does the uh, the CPU and the GPU pet processing power you have does that is that affected by how a lot like your virtual go to like your your virtual art design uh, or art department are these going in tandem with how complicated your virtual sets are with what you can run on the stage and depending on how fast and powerful your CPUs and GPUs are. That's a good question. I don't. Not not really been asked it before, but but should have been right. So so I think for the um, I don't know if I can talk about certain things publicly or not, but there are some re- there are some interesting real time uh, rendered venues you can go to. Right, there are some uh, concerts and some bands are starting to use virtual mm-hmm. uh, like game engines in real time. And in working with those companies they describe kind of what you did like uh, one's not going to be that complicated one maybe so what we end up doing is as a technology provider it's not just as simple as here's a couple of cpus and you know here's a system uh, good luck it we become advisors as well right that's what i'm saying like the reliance on art and technology really coming together like it makes sense for the for the technologists and the artists to be talking because we have an idea of what they, what it is they want to accomplish. And because it doesn't make economic sense, right? So a company like AMD wants to sell its technology, uh, but it also has to have an understanding of what the artists want to do with it. Mm -hmm. In order to sell technology, you can't make, say there are seven subsets of of how real-time virtual production goes it doesn't make economic sense for any company to buy to 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 make seven different cpus for one pre- thing so what we end up doing is um working with the oems original equipment manufacturers like dell or hp or 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 lenovo supermicro we end up coming up with systems that will more than cover one two and three 
and then maybe there's a system that covers three, uh, four, five, and six. So we know that if if you're going to be doing anything that falls under this umbrella, you should get this system. And if you know, mm-hmm. so so we don't. It, so we end up the configuration matters, um, but it doesn't matter that much. We also like that sort of background stuff. One of the other thing that's important too, because we're talking about it here, is is not having it be as complicated as I'm describing it. When you, we have a studio that we're talking to and that we want to accomplish this and this, great, you should have this. We don't need to get into the pedantics of, well, why are you going to be, uh, you know, having uh, this system and this is what the GPU is going to do? That's my American accent. I, I can't. <laughs> um, but, you know, or my, that's my scientific American accent. Um, <laughs> But you, you, you want to, um, you want to make it simple for the, for the person using the technology. I think, I think being disarming and making them feel like, uh, what you've, what you've advised them to get and what you've sold them is, is going to be the best. And that trust that they put in you, it's verified by the people before them that have used the same configuration. So, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it does, it does matter. And that's why, that's why uh, understanding the vertical that you're selling into um, matters as well. In this case, it's it's film. But virtual production is going to be is is used by architectural. It's used by car design. It's it's used in our, mm-hmm. uh, in um, medical science as well. So pioneered here in 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 Hollywood and and then used in in other verticals. Uh, let's talk about something a bit more recent. Uh, can you talk about AMD's role and uh, and work in the the creator? Oh yeah. So we work closely with, we've been working with Pixar now for, for, uh, for a while, um, for, for multiple years, Pixar have, um, created, uh, they've had it for a while, their renderer called Renderman. Um, everything, pretty much everything that comes out of industrial light and magic, which was born out of, you know, Star Wars back mm-hmm. in the seventies is rendered on Renderman. They are cousins because they're under the Disney umbrella. So Pixar is owned by Disney and so is Industrial Light and Magic um, and Lucasfilm. And uh, my my friend Gareth Edwards directed uh, the film and, and wrote it. And so I'm going to describe two different, a couple different things coming together congruently. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he reached out at the end of... Um, towards the end of the production and, and wanted... Since his film is about AI wanted our help in marketing the film because movie making is all about suspension of disbelief. So if you can have a company that is deeply involved in AI be part of the marketing of a film that's about AI, it, it's it's easier for the audiences to, to suspend their disbelief because it's almost like it gives it more of a of an authentic feel. Congruently um, Industrial Light and Magic did a lot of the visual effects, the virtual production on the film, which was in, in, in Pinewood, UK, which is where I grew up, actually, right by Pinewood Studios. Um, that's for another time. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, Gareth texted me and asked me if we wanted to uh, help uh, market the film, and, of course, we said yes. So we... Um, we we've been working with uh with the agency and with him and with with disney to uh help market the film and that was it was really challenging i think to do that during the strike so the the writer's mm-hmm. strike and the actor's strike so you had to get and you couldn't get gaming influences to the to the premiere because you know that might violate sag and they might not be able to get into sag so there were all these obstacles and promoting a film i think was 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 quite hard so we worked we worked promoting the film and then it was also rendered entirely on amd as well so the visual effects were rendered and and the film was was delivered via via uh, industrial light and magic so it was done on amd technology and and also uh on pixar's render man which is which is optimized on amd so it kind of describes without without getting too nitty gritty and pedantic the details, but but uh, but I think um, it might surprise people that uh, many people are involved in marketing a film um, before it comes out. A lot of meetings are had, and 
um, you know, what makes sense and how would this make sense or what, what would make sense to a consumer. And, and so, you know, having a chip company that works in AI working within helping marketing a film, that kind of makes sense. But if it was Sound of Music 3, you know, <laughs> AMD being part of the marketing, like, what does that mean? <laughs> Why would that, that wouldn't make sense? So it, it was kind of like uh, the planets lining up a little bit, particularly in light of the fact that that um, ILM um, use our technology and that the, the visual effects were done there. Yeah, okay, that, that was interesting. It, it, Gareth has talked a lot about about AI in general and just like his own interest or creative uses of AI. Um, where has that been on uh, your radar and with any of the? The tools or uses or, or anything that's out there yeah gareth well gareth actually i don't know if you knew this but he came to amd to get his ai education so to speak and he also uh asked our president and victor and our cto mark um multiple probing almost philosophical questions about ai that was that was kind of fun so ai is it's still an up and comer. Remember how we were talking about virtual within media and entertainment, right? So we were talking about how virtual production um, was was um, slower than we'd liked. Still pretty quickly adopted by Hollywood, but maybe slower than we'd liked. I I, I think that AI is is go- is quick is going to be quick more quickly adopted. Um, automatic rotoscoping, automatic wire mm. removal when you have stunts in a shot, um, frame recognition frame cataloging. Um, there's all sorts of ways in which AI is starting to be used in film, the res- resolution of something. So automatic formatting. So if a certain content delivery network is, is streaming a film to a device or they're about to be, they'll be able to say, oh, you know what, this is going to be 720p. I've got to render that. I've got to quickly render this out in 720p or 1080 1080p you know so a lo- even down to once something's made it, 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 it it'll it'll have a bearing on it so it, it definitely has a bearing in um in my day to day but a lot of it is uh in the form of um studios wondering what we are doing um as a as the technology arm of of the film business like what what are we doing and that answer would be a lot, and we're working with the software vendors too. You know, the the Adobe's, the Black Magics of the world, uh, Autodesk, those guys, the, the the guys that create the applications on on the silicon that is, of course, made by us and um, Intel and, and Nvidia. So it's um, we, we have to work with the with the software vendors. I just want to go back real quick to what you mentioned with uh, with with Gareth. So, what what is on the yeah. AMD AI uh, curriculum for <laughs> that you went over uh, that you taught uh, Gareth Edwards? One of the things we spoke about it it, it was recorded is um, the uh, it, it wasn't just straight technology; it was the ethics behind it. Um, and some of the great use cases are not just straight technology. One of them was talking about combating depression. And do you remember the movie Her with uh, Joaquin Phoenix? Yeah. And how he, you never saw, actually, I don't remember, I've only seen the film once, but I don't remember seeing the woman, uh, the voice, the female voice, I think it was Scarlett Johansson. Scarlett Johansson, yeah, but no, he never, she was always the voice. Yeah, but it was it was combating loneliness as well. So we spoke about that. How AI is it can make someone feel less lonely. So it wasn't just the the economic efficiencies, uh, the artistic efficiencies. It was also um, psychological and emotional. And so we were talking about that as well. And Gareth hit that in his film. If you if you notice towards the end of the film and that big the big battle sequence when they finally discovered where they where they were and he, they're run uh, they're running across the bridge i don't know um if mm-hmm. uh, you remember that sequence but they have multiple robots that are part of the family right um it's because you don't see what somebody looks like and what form they take it's how you feel about your interactions and what they say and and how they say it. So we, we spoke a bit about that as well. 
Um, and, I, and I think that's great. I mean, we're thinking about everything, not just the straight, uh, you know, the, the, the inherent overt benefits from AI going, scratching below that veneer. There's the emotional benefits of AI uh, as well. And, and that's what we spoke about. By the way, his film uh, is nominated for uh, Best Visual Effects for the Visual Effects Society <laughs> Awards and, uh, and and BAFTA, which which I'm particularly happy about. I saw that. Yeah, well, well, well deserved. Uh, yeah. I know, uh, bounce around a bit, but I know there was also, because uh, you sort of started on the Pixar and the Render Man, and that there also was an AMD connection with one of the more recent Pixar films, Elemental. So you want to talk about that uh, as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... We've been working with Pixar, like I said, for multiple years. I want to say four or five, something like that. And we've, um, we've retooled their render farm working closely with them. Um, so we, we kind of machine shop with, with, with Pixar in as far as try this. Hey, this works great, but what about this CPU? So we go back and forth and we, f- we figured out what, what their, their perfect uh, system was for them balancing their their different needs and they had told us about elemental uh years before they were announcing it and they had told us that it was their most and it was going to be their most ambitious film to date because each character was volumetric it had so much so many different uh ridiculous amounts of polygons and um you know Mm. geometries within the character i mean you've seen the film they're uh, they're all different elements so fire water water or fire or something yeah so yeah yeah yeah. and that's a significant amount of compute to be able to render those and re-render them um you know because you're going to get notes you're going to render the film and then you're going to get notes from the director and the producers more of this less of that cut this scene put this there and that takes a lot of a lot of compute, and so uh, they were able to speak publicly about AMD's role in it last September at SIGGRAPH in Los Angeles. Uh, it was the film was rendered on 156,000 cores of of AMD Epic CPUs. Which I mean, how do you have a gauge? Is that good? Is that you know? Is that a lot? It, it is and it isn't because it was all in in their data center. It was more cores and threads than they ever had in a a fairly small place and so they were able to render and re-render and iterate on on that big piece of art without bursting to the cloud and that was that was a never been Mm. never been done before type thing which was which was great to be a part of that and i love too that's nominated for best animated feature which is which is fantastic as well I think uh, also we showed at that thing because you know at, at the event it was the Pixar Renderman Arts and Science Fair. So each year at SIGGRAPH, Pixar host uh, an evening where they do some fun lectures for the visual effects community to show them what they've done and what where things are headed. And what they showed them too is we started. They started. Um, Elemental, I don't, I might get this wrong, but three or four years ago they, is when they mm-hmm. started it. And so when you start a film, it's locked into the technology purchased at that time and it's locked mm-hmm. into the mm-hmm. version of the software at that time. And you could understand why they would do that because it, it mitigates the risk of something going wrong if you enter in another piece of equipment or another version of a piece of software, it could derail the production. So they lock it in. So they they showed a side by side the frame of Elemental, their most ambitious film ever, and that same frame of Elemental rendered with the newest version of Renderman and uh, the newest version of AMD CPUs. And what it took what took three hours to render one frame of Elemental with the previous generation of AMD tech and the two, and the two previous versions of um, render man now took, it was three hours down to three minutes. Pretty. <laughs> that, isn't that insane? That's, crazy. That's an insane yeah. leap in performance. Um, but it was also because they, they had rewritten their, their software or the augmented their software to, to scale with the cores and threads you can think of they're like, they're like mini computers inside of a CPU. Mm-hmm. Um, if I was smart, I would have brought one with me to show you. But 
um, you know, <laughs> just think of a metal plate that looks like this, and well, we can, underneath uh, we'll find that an plate, image. you can find mm -hmm. an image. Yeah, but now the the render man software scales what we say linearly with whatever cores and threads are in that system, and so and so that the 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 leap was was uh, largely due to that as well. But that's that gives you a good example of the evolution of um, of, of technology and how quickly we are we are iterating. Mm -hmm. And I think too, it's great for the artist. Imagine if Leonardo da Vinci could have spent more time doing the Sistine Chapel. You know, it, it's if you have more time with the art, it's going to equal better art. And I and I think that uh, we we've become a big part of of helping the artist create. Um, better art is because we give them more time with it. Yeah, uh, it's funny. I actually had a question similar to this, but uh, with the uh, rapid advancing of just how fast and improved technology keeps getting, and Pixar is always like, yeah, they're always pushing the envelope with each film of which, like what's technically technologically possible. If you were to buy an off the shelf or just build your own off the shelf. Uh, a computer, you know, with like an AMD, a Threadripper, or something. What kind of Pixar film from the past do you feel like just some person in their bedroom could make today using, like, not having a render farm, but just having a regular PC? Uh, oh, I reckon what, you could do Toy Story. You could render. You could do Toy Story on it if you get a, Toy Story for sure. A, yeah, a, for, uh, yeah, yeah, Toy Story. Maybe Toy Story Two. I don't know. Sorry, Ash Brannon, if you if you're listening. Yeah, Ash Brannon is a <laughs> is an acquaintance of mine. He directed Toy Story 2. Um, we've, we've often thought about that, and I think in some of our conversations, and maybe even publicly, I think Pixar might have said something about how you could render Toy Story 1 or 2 on just one of these systems now. And it would also be interesting to go back and watch Toy Story 1 because it might look it might look like previs. I don't know. I think um, I remember when 4 came out and then all those comparison images were coming out of like an animal and they were showing like a cat from 1 and it was just like a very like hard surfaced kind of cat and then the cat from 2 that looks like photorealistic with the light and the fur and everything. Look at the fur in in the first ones if there was any fur or characters with <laughs> hair they wouldn't have moved. It was a, it was like a helmet, like my hair, like helmet. Yeah, like a, um, like a matted, matted my, fur. My head yeah. doesn't move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, now it, it, it flows. The because it was very, it would have been very, very expensive uh, back there. Actually, have a, a Toy Story poster. Where where we're based in LA is where everybody comes to discover new technology. RFX. So Ray Feeney, uh, he's the person that brought Silicon Graphics into film back in the eighties, mm -hmm. and so uh, this is where. Uh, most of Hollywood comes to discover new technology. And if I turn my camera around, um, you can see oh, there we go. Uh, there's a Toy Story Toy Story uh, poster in the middle of the frame. But you can also see Star Wars over there, Apocalypse Now, um, and they're all e signed by the original actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is where – So, and you could also see down there we have all these different systems – this is where we're figuring out. This is what I mean. Like in, 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 we're not just selling CPUs and GPUs into Hollywood. We're figuring out with the studios what works, what doesn't work. Um, and so we're not just a tech provider. We're also tech advisors, which I think is, mm -hmm. is what, is what the industry needs. Last one. I saw this into this thing, uh, from an article and, um, I don't really know what it means. I don't need to explain it. <laughs> but it mentioned that um, AMD is now in um, the uh, FPGA's field programmable gate arrays are in all RED cameras and all ARRI Alexa cameras. Uh, and that it's doing processing in camera uh, to help speed up things and take things away from post. Can you explain what is going on here and what, uh, what exactly this is? So, yeah, um, an FPGA is a, is a, is a, C, is a, is a chip that it has a single purpose. So and it's and it's bespoke for the customer. So for Ari and Red, for example, that's the brain in the camera, and it has one purpose. And it, it's in in that case, it's processing the the imagery. Um, uh, and so um, I, I'm not an engineer, full disclosure. So that that's from the bird's eye view, <laughs> that's what an, an FPGA is 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 about efficiency. So it, it has a single purpose. Um, in our Alveo cards. It, it does up-resing and down-resing in real time and has AI right on the chip. 
And so working with the camera companies like Red, who's just down the road, actually, Red are, Red are two blocks over, um, and we're particularly close with them, because it's our technology in those cameras, it makes it endlessly easier to do things in real time and also in post-production. So as something shooting, it, it can then also be uploading that footage in real time to the cloud on AMD CPUs, and we can start post-processing um, because, as you know, it would be edited, something would be edited all over the world. It also get, opens up the capabilities of, if it's our technology inside the camera, think of the virtual production capabilities of some, pulling something out of a frame, putting something in it. Those things you can play with with virtual production if you're shooting it with a RED or ARRI to maybe where, and this is just hypothetical, but these are things mm -hmm. you could do is with a green screen. Uh, you could have that green screen and these are just arbitrary numbers, but say the green screen is going at 48 frames a second or 120 frames a second, every third third of a second, that could just be green. So there, so therefore, you could do different things in the frame, or you could you could edit post production. So you could have on one hard drive, you could have a green screen pass and a uh, in front of the background pass um, without reshooting anything so there's all sorts of different capabilities uh, that uh, of us being in the in the brains of those cameras being the brain of of of, of those cameras I kind yeah no, of that's your question right yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I guess just something that wasn't quite um i mean a, i did not realize that there were amd chips in the cameras and then also that you know we have this possibility of doing processing or like possibly like comping or 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 doing post work like as we're filming yeah which yeah i think obviously speeds up so, a lot of things and opens up a lot of it's possibilities a, it's a uh, like a field programmable gate array so is what fpga it's not it's 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 basically a a, a chip that can be programmed for a purpose um and it's typically done but um bespoke for a for a for a customer like it's uniquely done but yeah no it it, it is a I think that's part of the reason why why we acquired the company is is all, all these use cases. Media is used all over the world. It's not just media. It's media and entertainment, mm -hmm. yes, but media. You've got Kaiser Permanente. You've got BP Oil. You've got you know Burberry. I'm just picking random brands. They all use media in some form mm -hmm. or fashion. Uh, uh, accident scene recreation, uh, recreation, I should say, not recreation, recreation. Um, <laughs> like uh, Nighthawk or something. Um, yeah. But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but, but media, take the media and entertainment, take media out of media and entertainment. It, it has much wider use than just entertaining people. It has practical use cases. Yeah, and the imaging, imagery is, is has a wide use outside of just Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I appreciate the time. Was there anything else um, you know, we didn't cover that was uh, worth mentioning or if it's on AMD's radar or AI or anything in general? Well, watch the space, but I, I'd, what, I'd, I'd love to say that um, don't just get your opinion on AI and where it's headed from listening to someone else's opinion, Right go and read about it in mo multiple different sites, magazines, whatever. Um, don't just get your, your view of AI from, from one source, get it from multiple because it, it may, it may not be what you think it is, you know, and it may, yeah. and it's going to help. It's going to help you to understand. Everybody should, should seek to understand when it comes to AI and don't do that from just one source. Yeah. I feel like the best way just get your hands involved in the, in the mess around with a yes. little bit. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's lovely to talk to you, Joey. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Likewise, James. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right. Cheers. And that is it. Thanks a lot for watching. And thanks again for James for coming on to the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up. And for more stuff like this, be sure to subscribe both to the YouTube channel and to the VP Land newsletter, vp-land.com to get our newsletter twice a week in your inbox with all sorts of stuff. Thanks for watching. I will catch you in the next episode.